Hey, all right. Psychological horror, I feel like, is a lot scarier than regular horror. It takes a lot more work and it actually scares you longer than after you turn the movie off. And I already did one video covering some psychological horror movies. This is a deeper video going even deeper into scarier ones and more obscure ones. So if you're excited, be sure to subscribe and I have a Discord. Go join that for my community and follow my Instagram. Anyways, let's get straight into this. Starting in the first layer, Angel Heart. We got Harry Angel played by Mickey Rourke. He's a private investigator, kind of down on his luck, you feel me? Then this mysterious dude, Louis Siffer, yeah, like Lou Siffer, rolls up. Robert De Niro plays him all cool and creepy. Cypher hires Harry to find this missing singer, Johnny Favorite. Seems straightforward, right? But bro, this isn't any regular missing person gig. Harry's investigation takes him from the dirty streets of New York to the eerie vibes of New Orleans. It's all jazz, voodoo, and bad omens. As Harry digs deeper, things get serious twisted. Everyone he talks to about Johnny ends up dead. It's like a curse and Harry's right in the middle of it. The atmosphere is thick with suspense and that supernatural feel. It's got Harry and you questioning what's real and what's just in his head. Turns out Johnny was into some dark stuff, like selling your soul stuff. The plot is thick with occult and mystery. Harry's world starts to unravel and so does his sanity. He's seeing all these freaky visions and uncovering some messed up truths. The movie's vibe is all about that psychological horror, blending reality with a nightmare. It keeps you on your toes, shoddy. You're trying to piece together the puzzle just like Harry is. And the ending? Homie, it's mind-blowing. The twist about Johnny Favorite and Lewis Cipher flips everything upside down. It's one of those, like, hold up, what just happened moments. Also, by the way, the occult is very evil, and Jesus provides salvation for anybody. Moving on. Circle. This is all about what happens when a bunch of strangers wake up in a dark room, standing in a circle. Sounds like the start of a bad joke, but it's way more intense. So here Here's what's going on. These people, there's like 50 of them, they're all from different walks of life. Young, old, all different backgrounds, and they've got no idea how they got there. And get this, bro. Every two minutes, one of them gets zapped and is out of the game. Like, permanently. It's wild. The twist, they gotta vote on who gets zapped next. Talk about stressful, right? It's like a messed up game where you've gotta decide who's gonna be the next to go. They're all trying to figure out the rules, why they're there, and how to survive. The tension is high, and the movie's all about the mind games they play. People are making a alliances, turning on each other, and trying to outsmart this crazy situation. It's a whole battle of wits and morality. As they get to know each other, secrets come out and biases are revealed. It's like a mirror to society showing how people judge each other. Some are trying to be fair, while others are playing dirty to survive. The movie's got this dark, ominous vibe. You're constantly wondering who's next and what they're gonna do to avoid it. It's intense, bro. And the climax is insane. It's super intense. Darling. This movie is a trip into psychological horror like no other. It's all black and white, artsy vibe but don't let that fool you, it's creepy as hell. So here's the deal, we got this girl, Darling, played by Lauren Ashley. She's got this mysterious vibe, you know, she takes this job as a caretaker in this old, kind of spooky New York mansion. But bro, the house has a rep. People say it's cursed, and the last caretaker, well, she didn't exactly leave on good terms. Darling's all alone in this big, eerie house, and shoddy things get weird really quick. She starts exploring, she finds this locked door on the top floor, and it's got her curiosity all in a chokehold. The atmosphere is thick with suspense, there's this old school horror feel with slow shots and eerie music. Darling starts losing her grip and you're right there with her, wondering what's real and what's in her head. She starts seeing things, hearing things, and it's like the house is messing with her head. The movie's got this psychological depth. Darling's past is kind of murky and as she spirals down, you're piecing together her story. It's trippy with hallucinations and flashbacks that make you question everything. And homie, the climax is when Darling's reality finally breaks down and the line between sanity and madness gets all blurred. It's crazy. The final. This movie's like a dark, twisted take on a high school drama, but with a horror twist. So here's what's up. We've got this group of outcasts at this high school, right? They're all tired of being bullied and messed with by the popular kids, but instead of just taking it, they decide to get revenge. And bro, their plan isn't just some prank. It's straight up diabolical. These outcasts, they set up this fake party at a remote house. It's like, come chill, have a good time. But shoddy, when the popular kids show up, it's anything but a good time. The outcasts drug them and then it's game on. The movie turns into this twisted survival game. The outcasts, they're all about teaching these bullies a lesson that they'll never forget. They've got this whole Saw meets high school vibe going on. It's intense with the outcasts wearing creepy masks and dishing out their own brand of justice. The popular kids, they're freaking out. They're trapped and they've got to deal with the consequences of how they treated others. It's like a messed up mirror showing them their own cruelty. The final plays with some deep themes like bullying and revenge. It's got that psychological horror element where you're kind of understanding what the outcasts 
are doing this, but it's also hella disturbing and <laughs> just wrong. The movie's got this dark, eerie atmosphere, and you're stuck in this moral gray area. But I mean, I mean, not not really, but you can kind of see where they're coming from, I guess. Like it's kind of a gray area, I guess. Horseman, bro, this movie is a deep dive into a dark, twisted mystery. It's got that psychological horror vibe with a side of detective work. So the story centers on this detective, Aiden Breslin, played by Dennis Quaid. He's kind of detached, you know, dealing with his wife's death and trying to connect with his two sons. But then he gets pulled into this wild case. The movie kicks off with this gruesome discovery, a woman's body and it's all kinds of messed up. Turns out it's linked to the biblical Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Yeah, you heard that right, we're talking some end of days creepy prophecy stuff. Aiden starts piecing together this puzzle and Shadi is like a race against time. Each murder is more twisted than the last, all themed around the horsemen. Conquest, war, famine, and death. It's like a serial killer's using the Bible as a playbook. As Aiden digs deeper, he uncovers this group calling themselves the Horsemen. It's a bunch of people with some seriously dark pasts and motives. They're all about bringing those biblical horrors to life and they're not holding back. The movie's got this tense, eerie atmosphere. You're right there with Aiden trying to crack the case before more bodies pile up. The clues are all cryptic, the suspects are messed up, and the whole thing is a mind game. The climax is intense. Aiden's personal life and the case collide, and it's a whole lot of like what the hell moments. And there's also a really like shocking final reveal. Identity. This movie is a mind bender for real. It's like a psychological horror meets a who done a mystery. So the scene is set at this motel during a nasty storm. Ten strangers end up there all random, like a wash up actress, a cop transporting a prisoner, a family, and a couple others. But shoddy, this is not any regular stormy night stay. Things get wild when they start finding dead bodies. It's like, surprise, you're in a murder mystery. Everyone's freaking out trying to figure out who the killer is among them. Among them? Among us? Among us? The tension is thick and the storm is not helping. The movie's got this eerie, suspenseful vibe. It plays with your head, bro. You're trying to piece together the clues just like the characters, and the characters, they're all sorts of interesting, each with their own secrets and stories. But here's the twist. It ain't just a simple murder mystery. There's this whole other layer. The plot flips to this court hearing about a serial killer, and you're like, what the hell does this have to do with the motel? It's all connected, though, in the wildest way. As the night goes on, the deaths pile up, and the survivors are losing it. They're trying to survive, figure out the connection between them and who's behind this. The story keeps you guessing, throwing curveballs left and right. The climax is a mind trip. The big reveal ties everything together in a way that's like, no way, did not see that coming. It's clever, kind of shocking, and definitely makes you rethink the whole movie. Magic. Bro, this movie's a trip into some serious psychological horror territory. It's got ventriloquism, but with a super creepy twist. So here's what's up. We've got this dude, Corky, played by Anthony Hopkins. He's a ventriloquist, but homie's not just about throwing his voice. He's got his dummy named Fats, and Shotty Fats is not your average puppet. This thing's got a mind of his own, or so it seems. Corky's on the brink of big time success, but he's also on the edge. You feel me? He's got some serious mental health issues, and it's like Fats is a part of him. His dark side. Corky talks to Fats like he's real, and Fats talks back, but it's all kinds of sinister. The plot thickens when Corky skips out on a big TV opportunity because he's afraid of a mental health check. He heads back to his hometown and runs into his old crush, Peggy, played by Anne Margaret. Corky's all trying to rekindle things, but Fats has some other plans. Things get real twisted. Corky's losing grip on what's him and what's Fats. It's like a psychological battle with the dummy calling some creepy shots. The movie's got this tense, eerie vibe, like you're never sure if Fats is really alive or just in Corky's head. As Corky gets closer to Peggy, Fats gets more controlling and violent. It's a dark, twisted love triangle. Corky, Peggy, and a creepy, freaky puppet. The suspense builds as Corky struggles with his sanity and Fats' influence. The climax is intense, shoddy. Corky's gotta face his demons, literally, and it's a showdown that's as much mental as it is physical. Megan is missing. This movie's a serious dive into the dark side of the internet. It's a found footage style flick and it gets real intense. So the story is about these two girls, Megan and Amy. Megan, she's the wild one, always partying and chatting up dudes online. Amy's the more shy type, but they're besties. Megan starts talking to this guy online, Josh. He seems cool, but bro, there's some major red flags. Megan decides to meet up with Josh, and that's where things go south. She goes missing just like that. Amy is freaking out trying to find her friend, but there's no trace of Megan. The movie gets real as Amy digs deeper into Megan's online life, trying to figure out what happened. The movie's got this raw, gritty feel. It's like a cautionary tale about online strangers and the scary stuff that can happen. The whole thing's shot like it's actual footage from their phones and cameras, which makes it 
even more chilling. As Amy gets closer to the truth, things get more dangerous. She's dealing with cops, Megan's online friends, and her own emotions. It's like a mystery, but with this heavy real-life horror vibe. The climax is intense. Amy faces the reality of what happened to Megan, and shoddy, it's a hard-hitting, gut-wrenching reveal. This movie does not hold back on showing the dangers these girls face. The Neon Demon. Bro, this movie's like a wild trip into the world of fashion. So the story is about this young model, Jessie, played by Elle Fanning. She's fresh in LA, trying to make it big in the modeling scene. Jessie's got this innocent, natural beauty, and shoddy, everyone is noticing, from photographers to other models. But here's the twist. The fashion world is not just about pretty faces and runways. It's cutthroat, and I mean that literally. The other models, like Sarah and Gigi, they're kind of obsessed with Jessie. It's like her youth and beauty has got them all kinds of envious. The movie's got this surreal, artsy feel. It's visually stunning with neon lights and this eerie atmosphere. Jessie's rising fast, but with fame comes some creepy stuff. There's this vibe that everyone wants a piece of her. Her looks, her youth, and more. Like a literal piece of her. <laughs> As Jessie gets deeper into the scene, things get more twisted. It's like a psychological horror show, with beauty and obsession turning into something nightmarish. The other models, they're ready to do whatever it takes to stay on top. The climax is intense. Jessie is caught in this bizarre, dangerous world where beauty's like a curse. The other models take their obsession to the extreme, and it's a whole lot of what the hell is happening. The Night. This movie's a total head trip. It's like psychological horror that messes with your mind big time. So we got this Iranian couple, Babak and Nita, and their little baby. They're living in the US, and one night, after kicking it with friends, they get lost driving home. Bro, it's like the GPS is on the fritz or something. They decide to crash this hotel, but homie, this is not no holiday inn. The hotel's got some creepy, creepy, serious, spooky vibes. The night clerk's all weird, and the place feels like it's stuck in time, but that's just the start. But back and Nita start experiencing some freaky stuff. We're talking weird noises, creepy visions, the works. It's like the hotel's messing with them. The wild part is they can't leave. Every time they try, they end up right back in the hotel. It's a loop of terror, shoddy, and it's not just random spooks. The hotel's bringing up all their personal demons, stuff they've been keeping buried. But back has got some secrets, and so does Nita. The hotel's like a mirror showing them their deepest fears and guilt. It's intense, bro. They gotta confront their past, their choices, all while trying to protect their baby and figure out how to break this creepy cycle. The climax is a showdown with themselves. It's about facing what they've done and finding a way out of this nightmare. The movie's got this eerie, suspenseful vibe, and it keeps you guessing what's real and what's just in their heads. Sisters. This movie's like a classic psychological thriller with some wild twists. So the story's about these Siamese twins, Danielle and Dominique, played by Margot Kidder. They've been separated, but shoddy, their connection is still deep. Danielle's the sweet one, trying to live a normal life, but Dominique, she's got issues, big ones. Danielle's dating this dude, and after a night out, things go sideways. A neighbor, Grace, she's this peeping Tom journalist, and she sees something wild through the window. We're talking murder, bro. But here's the kicker, only Danielle is there when the cops show up, and there's no sign of a body. Grace goes full detective mode, trying to figure out this mystery. It's like a puzzle where every piece is more twisted than the last. She discovers some dark secrets of the twins' past. Think creepy doctors, weird experiments, the whole nine yards. As Grace digs deeper, the suspense cranks up. She's getting closer to the truth, but it's all kinds of dangerous. The movie's got this eerie vibe, mixing slasher scares with psychological horror. It keeps you on the edge of your seat, trying to piece it all together. The climax is a showdown of truth, is intense, with revelations about Danielle, Dominique, and their twisted backstory. It's interesting as hell. Torment. This one's an old school psychological horror that's all kinds of twisted. So the movie centers around this woman, Christina, who's living a not so fairy tale life with her abusive husband Paul. This guy Paul, he's a piece of work, controlling, manipulative, the whole nine yards. And shoddy Christina's at her breaking point. But here's where it gets real wild. Christina starts having these bizarre, terrifying dreams. We're talking full-on nightmares where she's tormented by this demonic figure. It's like her subconscious is unleashing all her fears and trauma. And as if that's not enough, there's this new guy Larry who comes to the picture. He seems cool, a breath of fresh air compared to Paul. Christina and Larry Larry hit it off, and it's like she's finally seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. But bro, the mind games in this movie are next level. You start wondering what's real and what's just in Christina's head. The line between reality and her nightmares gets all blurred. It's a trip with scenes that mess with you, making you question everything. The climax is intense. Christina's caught in this psychological battle, trying to figure out her life, her dreams, and what they mean. It's a showdown of her facing her demons, both real and imagined. See no evil. So the story revolves around Sarah, played by Mia Farrow 
Pharaoh. She's this young girl who recently got blinded in a horse riding accident. Now imagine dealing with that. Your whole world changes, right? Sarah's staying with her family at their country house, trying to adapt to her new life. But shoddy things take a dark turn. Sarah's whole family gets murdered while she's in the house. The twist is that she doesn't realize it because of her blindness. It's like she's living in this house with a killer and she doesn't even know it. The movie's got this eerie vibe playing with what Sarah can and can't see. You're right there with her, feeling her fear and helplessness. It's all about the sounds and Sarah's perception. The suspense is off the charts, bro. As Sarah starts piecing the things together, tension cranks up. She's gotta rely on her other senses to figure out what happened and to stay safe. It's like a deadly game of cat and mouse, but she can't see the cat. The climax is this intense edge of your seat showdown. Sarah's gotta use her wits against the killer. The whole setup's clever, using her blindness to ramp up the horror and suspense. The Unseen. Bro, this movie's a wild blend of psychological horror and some real deep emotional stuff. So here's what's going down. We got this dude, Bob, a former hockey player. Homie's life isn't exactly smooth skating though, he's got this strange condition. Parts of his body are like becoming invisible. Uh, you heard that right, dude's literally disappearing bit by bit. Talk about some next level personal issues. Bob's got a family but he's living away from them, trying to deal with his condition on his own. He's all isolated in this small town, working at a lumber mill and keeping it to himself. But things take a wild turn when his ex-wife hits him up. Their daughter, Eva, has gone missing. Now Bob's gotta face his past, his family, and his condition. He heads back to his old life trying to find Eva. But it is not just a simple missing person case. As he digs deeper, he uncovers some dark secrets about the town and some sketchy folks. The vibe of the movie is intense and eerie. It's got that psychological horror feel mixed with a real emotional punch. Bob's struggle with his condition, his family, and the search for his daughter, it all blends into this suspenseful, creepy journey. The climax is all about revelations, both personal for Bob and about the mystery he's unraveling. It's emotional, it's tense, and it ties up the story in a way that's both satisfying and kind of haunting. The Unseen is one of those psychological horrors that goes beyond just scares. It's about dealing with the unseen, both literally in Bob's case, and metaphorically metaphorically with the hidden pains and secrets that we all carry. It's deep, it's got layers, and it'll have you thinking long after the credits roll. Possession. This movie's a mind-bending dive into psychological horror and some serious relationship drama. So we got this couple, Mark and Anna, played by Sam Neill and Isabel Ajani. Their marriage is on the rocks, like big time. Mark's been away on some spy work, and when he gets back, he finds out Anna's been having an affair. But shoddy, that's just the start of the crazy. Anna's behavior gets more and more erratic. It's like she's got some dark, deep secrets she's not sharing. Mark's trying to figure out what's up, but the more he digs, the weirder it gets. We're talking supernatural level weird. The movie's got this intense, surreal vibe. The scenes between Mark and Anna are like emotional roller coasters. Passionate, violent, and super intense. And then there's this creature bro, it's like something out of a Lovecraftian nightmare. The film plays with themes of obsession, madness, and the breakdown of a relationship. It's like watching a marriage implode with a side of horror. Anna's breakdown is intense and Isabella Johnny's performance is next level. She goes all in. The climax is this wild blend of personal drama and horror. It's got symbolism, metaphorical stuff, and legit scary moments. The movie's not just about a failing marriage, it's about the demons we all carry. Rusty Lake Paradox. This short film is a trip, like a blend of escape room puzzles and mind-bending horror. It's all sorts of mysterious and creepy. Dale's gotta figure out how to get out, but it's no simple task. The room is filled with puzzles puzzles, clues, and some seriously weird stuff. Think surreal like a David Lynch film meets an escape game, there's this whole otherworldly vibe where nothing's quite what it seems. As Dale solves the puzzle, things get more twisted. He discovers clues about his past, the hotel, and some freaky family history. It's like each puzzle piece reveals something more bizarre than the last. The film's got this dark, atmospheric feel. You're right there with Dale trying to piece together the mystery. It's tense, it's strange, and it's totally captivating. The climax is wild. Dale's discoveries lead to some shocking revelations about the hotel. It's a blend of psychological horror, it's a real mystery, and a bit of the supernatural. By the way, this is also like based on a game, I think? And the game looks pretty actually kind of sick. I love puzzle games. The Stylist. So the story is all about this hairstylist, Claire. She seems chill, doing her thing, cutting hair, styling, you know, salon stuff. But shoddy, Claire's got a dark side. After hours, she's living a whole different life. She's obsessed with her clients to the point where she she wants to become them. Here's the creepy part. Claire collects her client's scalps. Yeah, you heard that right. It's her way of trying to connect to feel what they feel. But it's all kinds of messed up. She wears these scalps like wigs, getting lost in the fantasies of being 
someone else. The film's got this eerie, suspenseful vibe. You're watching Claire spiral deeper into her obsession. It's like a psychological character study, but with horror movie vibes. She's battling loneliness, longing for connection, but going about it in the most twisted way. Things get even more intense when Claire's favorite client, Olivia, asks her to style her hair for her wedding. It's like Claire's ultimate fantasy, but it pushes her over the edge. She starts stalking Olivia, getting more obsessed, and things start to unravel. The climax is a mix of emotional breakdown and horror. Claire is caught in her own twisted world, struggling with her identity and her dark urges. It's like it's like watching someone lose themselves completely. The twin. So here's the lowdown. We got this family, Rachel and Anthony, and their son Elliot. They're grieving because they just lost Elliot's twin brother in a tragic accident. Heavy stuff, Shadi. To cope, they move to this remote Scandinavian village, thinking a fresh start is what they need. But bro, things start getting weird, like real quick. Elliot starts acting all strange, saying his dead twin is talking to him. It's giving off major creepy vibes. Rachel is freaked out, thinking her son is losing it, or maybe there's something more supernatural at play. The film's got this eerie, isolated feel. You're right there with the family, stuck in this remote place, dealing with grief and now some spooky twin mystery. The atmosphere is thick with suspense and a sense of dread. As Rachel digs deeper, she uncovers some dark secrets about the village and its creepy twin folklore. It's like a puzzle, with each piece more unsettling than the last. She's gotta figure out what's up with Elliot and if there's a way to save him from whatever's happening. The climax is intense, Rachel is facing off against these twisted village secrets and trying to protect her son. Pretty serious. Fear in the night. So we got the school teacher Peggy, played by Judy Geeson. Shadi's recovering from a nervous breakdown and things are about to get a whole lot more stressful. Peggy moves to this remote countryside school where her husband works. But bro, right off the bat, she gets attacked by a mysterious one-armed man in her bedroom. Talk about a rough start. The weird part, there's no evidence of the attack, making everyone think it's all in her head. The movie's got this eerie, isolated setting, perfect for brewing up some psychological horror. Peggy's trying to convince everyone she's not crazy, but the more she digs, the more twisted the plot gets. It's a classic, is she or isn't she losing it? As the story unfolds, Peggy discovers some dark secrets about the school and its staff. There's a whole web of lies and deceit that she's caught up in. The suspense builds as she gets closer to the truth, but the danger ramps up too. The climax is intense. Peggy's facing off against her fears and unraveling the mystery. It's a showdown that's as much about her battling her inner demons as it is confronting the real threat. This one keeps you guessing. It's like kind of old school too. Case 39. Case 39 is a horror thriller that'll have you second guessing those child rescue stories. It stars Renee Zellweger as Emily, a social worker who rescues this 10 year old girl named Lilith from her abusive parents. But shoddy, Lilith is not your typical distressed kid. After Emily saves Lilith, played by Jodel Ferland, weird stuff starts happening. People around Emily begin dying in bizarre ways, and it's like, hold up, is Lilith connected to this? The plot thickens as Emily starts questioning Lilith's innocence. The film cranks up the creep factor with Lilith's eerie demeanor and some serious supernatural undertones. It's got that evil child horror trope, but with a fresh twist. Emily's caught in this nightmare where she's trying to protect Lilith while also figuring out if she's the cause of all this chaos. As the story unfolds, Emily uncovers some horrifying truths about Lilith. We're talking demonic vibes, bro. The suspense and fear escalate as Emily realizes she might have bitten off more than she can chew with this case. The climax is a face-off between Emily and the true nature of Lilith. It's tense, it's chilling, and it's got some wild revelations. The movie plays with themes of good versus evil and the deceptive nature of appearances. Speak No Evil Speak No Evil is a psychological horror that's all about social awkwardness turning deadly. So we got this Danish family, Louis, Bjorn, and their daughter Agnes. They're on vacation vibing when they meet this Dutch family, Patrick and Karen, with their son Abel. It's all good, they hit it off and later get invited to visit them in the Netherlands. But bro, when they visit, things get weird real quick. The Danish family starts noticing some offbeat, unsettling behavior from their hosts. The tension is thick with this constant feeling that something isn't right. The movie's a slow burn, building up the suspense with awkward situations that turn increasingly uncomfortable. It's got this vibe where you're screaming, just leave already, but they stay and it gets worse. The climax is intense. The psychological tension reaches a breaking point, leading to a disturbing and shocking conclusion. Speaking of evil plays in the fears of politeness and the horror of not listening to your gut 
but when things seem off. You Are Not My Mother. You Are Not My Mother is a horror flick rooted in Irish folklore, and Shadi is earring. Shar, a teen girl, is dealing with her mom Angela's mysterious disappearance. Then just as suddenly, Angela returns, but she's different. Colder, creepier, just off. The movie's set around Halloween in a Dublin suburb, adding to the spooky atmosphere. Shar starts digging into her family's past and discovers some dark secrets tied to Irish folklore and shanglings. It's like a cultural horror story that gets under your skin. As Shar unravels the mystery, the film blends psychological horror with supernatural stuff too. It's a tense, atmospheric journey through family dynamics, mental illness, and eerie folklore. The climax blends emotional family revelations with chilling horror elements, leading to a confrontation between Shar and the entity that's taken over her mother, Chained. Chained takes you into the world of psychological and captivity horror. It's about this taxi driving serial killer, Bob, and his young captive, Tim. After Bob murders Tim's mom, he keeps Tim as his chained up prisoner. The movie's dark, bro. It dives into this twisted relationship between captor and captive. Bob forces Tim to bury the bodies of his victims and tries to mold him into a killer too. It's like a sick, twisted form of father-son bonding, it's weird. As Tim grows up, the psychological manipulation intensifies. He's caught between survival, Stockholm Syndrome, and the fear of becoming like Bob. The film explores themes of nature versus nurture, control, and the fear of violence. The climax is a gripping confrontation between Tim's will to resist Bob's influence and his desire for freedom. Chained is a harrowing tale of captivity and the psychological scars it leaves. It's intense, disturbing, and makes you think about the impact of trauma. Citadel. Citadel is a psychological horror film that taps into the deepest fears of urban isolation and paranoia. The movie revolves around Tommy, a young father who's grappling with severe agoraphobia after a brutal attack by a gang of hooded youths leaves his wife in a coma and ultimately dead. The attack not only devastates Tommy emotionally, but also leaves him petrified of the outside world, especially as he now has to care for his newborn daughter alone. The horror intensifies when Tommy becomes convinced that the same gang is stalking him and planning to abduct his daughter. His fears are dismissed by others as just symptoms of his trauma-induced condition, but the film expertly blurs the lines between reality and Tommy's anxiety-driven perceptions. The director builds a really like chilling atmosphere using the bleak, decaying housing estate where Tommy lives to amplify the sense of dread and claustrophobia. As Tommy's paranoia escalates, he joins forces with a renegade priest who believes the gang members are not human but demonic creatures preying on the city's children. The film takes a turn into the supernatural, exploring themes of fear and vulnerability and the primal instinct to protect like your offspring. The climax is both emotionally and visually striking, with Tommy facing his deepest fears in a confrontation that is as much a battle with his internal demons as with the external threat. Citadel is a haunting tale, it's scary. Doctor. Doctor is a gripping medical thriller that delves into the dark underbelly of the healthcare industry. The film centers on Dr. Siva, who is a highly skilled and compassionate surgeon. His life takes a dramatic turn when he discovers a massive organ trafficking racket within the hospital where he works. The revelation sets him on a dangerous path as he becomes determined to expose and dismantle the corrupt system. The film brilliantly portrays Portrays the ethical dilemmas faced by medical professionals and the moral decay within institutions meant to heal and save lives. Dr. Siva, as the protagonist, is a complex character, a healer who must navigate a world rife with greed, corruption, and moral bankruptcy. His journey is fraught with risks as he confronts powerful adversaries who will stop at nothing to protect their interests. The climax is a high stakes showdown that not only tests Dr. Siva's resolve, but also his ethics as a doctor. Doctor is an engaging and a thought-provoking film that raises important questions about the state of healthcare and the price of integrity in a world driven by profit. A Field in England A Field in England is a psychedelic historical thriller set during the English Civil War. The film, directed by Ben Wheatley, is a hallucinatory journey into madness, mysticism, and the macabre. It follows a group of deserters fleeing from a raging battle who are captured by an alchemist named O'Neill. O'Neill forces the group to help him search for a hidden treasure that he believes is buried in a field. This film is an experimental blend of horror, drama, and black comedy with a heavy emphasis on surreal and mind-bending imagery. The characters, each with their distinct quirks and secrets, find themselves in an increasingly bizarre and dangerous situation as they delve deeper into the field and under the influence of O'Neill's manipulative control. The narrative is non-linear and fragmented, reflecting the disorienting experience of the characters as they consume hallucinogenic mushrooms that alter their perception of reality. The 
film's stark black and white cinematography adds to the eerie, otherworldly atmosphere, making the English countryside seem both beautiful and menacing. As the search for the treasure progresses, the distinctions between master and servant blur, and the character's sanity begins to, like, uh, unravel. The climax is a chaotic crescendo of visual and auditory hallucinations, and the ending is really, like, hard to perceive and hard to understand and comprehend. It's open to interpretation or whatever. Kill List This movie is a hardcore mix of crime thriller and psychological horror. We got Jay and Gal, two ex-soldiers turned hitmen. Jay's been out of the game for a bit, dealing with family drama and some deep personal issues, but homie is strapped for cash, so he teams up with Gal for a new gig, a kill list. The job seems straight up at first, a few targets, something they can't handle, but shoddy things spiral out of control real fast. Each lead hits them deeper into a dark, twisted world. It's like they stumbled into a nightmare they can't wake up from. The movie's got this gritty, realistic feel, but then it flips into this eerie, almost cult-like horror. Jay becomes obsessed with the list, and his sanity starts slipping. It's like every kill is dragging him further from reality. As the plot unfolds, the lines between the hitman's work and some sinister, unknown forces get blurred. It's a wild ride with crazy twists that make you question what's really going on. The climax is a mind-blowing mix of revelations and horror. Jay's final target brings the whole twisted journey to a shocking conclusion. Kill List is a film that messes with your head, blending the brutality of hitmen with the unpredictability of psychological horror. After watching this, you'll be thinking twice about the demons that haunt us, both in our jobs and in our minds. Vivarium. Vivarium is a psychological sci-fi horror that'll have you questioning reality. It's about this couple, Tom and Gemma. They're house hunting looking for their dream home, but bro, they end up in this surreal, labyrinth-like suburb called Yonder. Every house looks the same, and homie, they can't find their way out. The real, the real twist comes when they find a baby in a box with a creepy message. Raise the child and be released. It's like some twisted fairy tale. The kid grows super fast and he's all kinds so weird. He mimics them, watches them, it's super creepy. The film's got this eerie, claustrophobic vibe. Tom and Gemma are stuck in this artificial, endless suburb, raising this bizarre child. It's a disturbing look at suburban life, parenthood, and the loss of individuality. As they try to escape yonder, the film dives into their psyche. They're dealing with the isolation, desperation, and the surreal nature of their situation. The climax is both emotionally and visually striking. The the couple faces the harsh truth of their situation, leading to a bizarre and unsettling conclusion. Bavarium is a film that plays with your mind, exploring themes of conformity, societal expectations, and the unnerving aspects of domestic life. After watching this, those picture-perfect suburbs and the idea of a normal life might just give you the chills. Wildling Wildling is a blend of coming-of-age drama and dark fantasy horror. It's about this girl Anna who's been locked away in an attic her whole life by a man she calls daddy, but shoddy, he's not her real father. He tells her scary stories about the wildling, a monster that preys on children. But here's the thing, when Anna's freed and taken in by the sheriff and her brother Ray, she starts experiencing the outside world for the first time. It's all new and overwhelming, but there's more to it. Anna's body starts changing in weird, wild ways. The film's got this eerie fairy tale vibe, mixing horror with with a deep exploration of puberty and transformation. Anna's journey is about discovering her true nature and origins. It's like a metaphor for growing up, but with a supernatural edge. Oh my gosh, all right, layer one is over. This iceberg only has two layers because I'm only covering two layers of this iceberg because there's just so many entries in them. Um, so yeah, into the final layer, I guess. About halfway through the video. <laughs> Afterlife. Afterlife is not your typical ghost story. It's a deep, thoughtful, dive into what makes life worth living. So picture this, when people pass away, they end up at this sort of way station, a place that's neither here nor there. It's like a stop before the final destination, you know? The deal is, each person's gotta pick one memory from their life, just one, to live in forever. Kinda wild, right? The film follows a bunch of different characters, each wrestling with their choice. It's a mix of nostalgia, regret, and reflection. The staff at this way station, they're like guides, helping helping the souls make their choice, but shoddy, these workers have their own stories and mysteries too. It's a journey through human experiences, emotions, and the memories that shape us. 
The film's got this calm, contemplative vibe. It's not just about scares or typical horror stuff. It's more like a meditation on life, death, and the moments that matter. Each character's choice reveals something about their life, their joys, and their sorrows. The climax is not dramatic in the usual sense, but it's powerful in its simplicity. It's about acceptance, closure, and the beauty of human experience. Afterlife is a film that sticks with you, making you think about what memory you'd choose. It's a unique, thoughtful take on the afterlife that's both poignant and deeply human. The Black String. This movie's about this guy named Frankie, who's a lonely guy working at a convenience store. His life is pretty mundane, but things take a wild turn after a one-night stand. Jonathan hooks up with this woman he meets through a dating hotline, but soon after, he starts experiencing some freaky symptoms. We're talking rashes, hallucinations, and some seriously disturbing visions. Dude thinks he's been cursed or something. The film's got this intense, paranoid atmosphere. Jonathan's convinced he's caught up in some dark, supernatural conspiracy. He starts digging for answers, but the more he searches, the blurrier the line gets between reality and his paranoia. As Jonathan spirals deeper into his obsession, his life starts falling apart. His family and friends think they're losing it, but he's determined to prove there's something more sinister at play. The movie does a killer job blending psychological horror with elements of body horror. The climax is a trip. It's this intense, dark revelation where Jonathan faces the truth behind his condition. The movie leaves you questioning what's real and what's a product of Jonathan's unraveling mind. The Black String is a horror film that messes with your head. Come back to me. This one's all about creepy supernatural vibes. It's like, imagine you're living your life, and then bam, weird stuff starts happening. The main character starts having these bizarre blackouts and can't figure out why. It's a mind bender for sure. The movie dives deep into themes of trauma and memory and some seriously spooky resurrection stuff. It's the kind of film that leaves you second guessing every shadow in your room at night. The Disappointments Room. Talk about a title that sets the mood, right? This film's got a haunted house, mysterious pasts, and secrets hidden in, well, a disappointments room. The story follows a family that moves into a rural dream house, but surprise, surprise, it's got more skeletons in its closet than they bargained for. So basically, in this, like, scary house, there's this mysterious secret room in the attic. And then eventually they find the key and unlock the door, and they go into the disappointments room, and they discover the dark history of the family that lived there back in the 19th century. Don't answer the phone. Old school horror alert. This one's a throwback, giving off those vintage slasher vibes. It's about a serial killer terrorizing the streets of LA, and let's just say he's not the type you'd want to bump into in a dark alley. The film mixes elements of thriller and horror with a heavy dose of suspense. This one actually is kind of like old and classic. It's from 1980, and it's kind of got themes of like, uh, like how we treat our veterans too, because basically what it is is like it's a Vietnam War veteran who's the guy who's like stalking women and killing killing them, like strangling them to death is what he does. He stalks them in their Hollywood homes and strangles them. And then a lieutenant at like the police station locally starts an investigation that doesn't really go anywhere, but then a psychologist gets like these disturbing phone calls from the, the, uh, the veteran who's killing people. And then eventually the psychotic veteran starts going after Gail's parents. Sorry, Gail is the psychologist, sorry, I should have said that earlier. <laughs> and then eventually Gail herself even gets kidnapped at some point. Don't blink. So picture this. A group of friends roll up to this mountain resort, right? They're looking for a good time, but the place is dead, like eerily empty. They start poking around, and one by one, people start vanishing. Poof, just like that. No screams, no signs, just gone. The group's freaking out, trying to figure out what's up. It's got this serious Twilight Zone vibe, with a little bit of Lovecraftian mystery. So they get there, right? And then they can't leave because, like, the long drive up there, there's no gas left. And they can't refill them because the gasoline tanks at the the, like resort ever have been like locked so they're all just stuck there and there's no cell service obviously because it's a horror movie and there's also some really mysterious things going on here at this place too like they find that the lake has been frozen over despite warm weather and that there are literally no insects or animals around so this guy named Alex wants to leave, but this other guy named Jack insists on staying because, like, the resort actually has supplies and so, like, they can survive. But then a girl named Tracy goes missing, and then most of them decide to stay, right? But then Sam, like, 
shoots Alex because he tries to leave. It's just a whole lot of mystery. Like Alex ends up threatening the group after he gets shot but survives it, but then he commits suicide himself, so he just still dies. <laughs> but his body disappears, so like a lot of people vanish. Like he disappears, Noah disappears, Ella disappears after Jack and Noah, or no, no, after Jack and Ella have sex, not Jack and Noah, because Noah appears after Ella and Jack have sex because Ella disappears and Noah comes up. It's, this one's kind of confusing. There's so many characters, bro. This one's kind of cool though. I got a shirt at Goodwill that like I think I'm wearing it right now. Actually, I'm wearing it right now. This says "Don't blink on it." It's like from the movie. It's pretty sick. Haunts. This one's a trip. Ingrid, the main girl, is dealing with some heavy stuff. Her life is a roller coaster of creepy and traumatic events. Like first she gets attacked in her home, then all this weird stuff starts happening around town, like a series of brutal attacks. But here's the twist: as the movie unfolds, you kind of have to question what's real and what's just in her head. Basically, Ingrid is a Swedish girl living with her American uncle in America. Swedish? Is that a Drain Gang reference? Is that a Blade reference? Is she, does, she, does she know Blade? And then one night a local girl gets murdered with scissors, right? And then when she gets attacked, that like brings back the trauma of when she was sexually abused by her father and also that her mother killed herself after. This movie's really dark. And then another person gets attacked and killed and Ingrid finds her body the next day on the farm. And she was also killed with scissors. And then there's a lot more stuff that happens. I don't really want to spoil it because it's really, really good, but, um... Okay, I actually lied about it being good, but, um... Moving on. House hunting. Imagine two families just trying to find their dream home. They stumble upon this house in the woods, but things get weird fast. They find this girl that can't speak, and then, bam, they're trapped. Can't leave the property no matter how hard they try. The days drag on, and cabin fever sets in. The family starts seeing things like ghosts and visions. It's a psychological horror that plays on the idea of being trapped in the mind game that come with it. I can see you. This one's a head-spinning psychological thriller. Imagine you're an ad dude heading to the woods with your crew for some inspiration, but instead you dive deep into a mind-bending trip. Ben Richards and his team get more than they bargained for when they start experiencing some freaky stuff. Hallucinations, distorted photos, and a creepy sense of dread. There's this vibe of David Lynch meets Videodrome, and it's all about losing your grip on reality. Thinking, Think missing faces, eerie visions, and a complete meltdown. Last shift. Rookie cop Jessica Lawrence's first night on the job turns into a nightmare. She's alone in a police station that's about to close but is haunted by the ghosts of a cult. These aren't your average spooks, we're talking about followers of Paimon, the king of hell, who off themselves in the station. Lauren faces freaky hallucinations, ghostly cultists, and a twisted journey into her past. The tension is off the charts as she tries to make it through the night. It's a blend of like haunted house horror with a cop drama twist, it's got some serious chills. The Lost. This one's a dark, suspenseful crime drama. A young girl, Olivia, goes missing during her birthday party, and Detective Holloway and Costa are on the case. It's a maze of twists and turns with child abduction, abuse, and trafficking in the mix. The story is told non-linearly, jumping back and forth in time, and each person they interview has a different version of the truth. Detective Holloway is a tough, rude dude chasing a promotion, and the suspects range from the girl's parents to a Romanian housekeeper. The the atmosphere is really heavy and the film is like really like grim and gritty. The Premonition. This psychological horror film centers on Andrea Fletcher, a clinically insane woman and former pianist, who seeks her biological daughter, Janie. Janie's been raised by foster parents due to Andrea's inability to take care of her. Andrea, aided by her circus clown boyfriend Jude, locates and begins stalking Janie. Andrea breaks into the house of her foster parents and after a confrontation, she flees, leaving Janie's doll behind. The incident deeply shakes Janie Janie's foster mother, Sherry, who then begins having psychic visions and premonitions. R Meanwhile, Andrea has a complete nervous breakdown, which leads to a fatality. She dies. As the police search for Andrea, unaware of her death, Sherry is drawn to a rural lake by her visions. The police find Andrea's body in the lake. Sherry's premonitions and psychic connection to Andrea ultimately lead her to Janie, culminating in a dramatic and supernatural resolution. The Reincarnation of Peter Proud In this psychological horror film, Peter Proud 
a college professor in Los Angeles is haunted by recurring dreams of a past life. He dreams of being a man murdered by his girlfriend, Marsha, while swimming in a lake. Peter seeks medical help and, after recognizing locations from his dreams in a documentary, travels to Massachusetts. There, he discovers familiar sights and eventually meets Marsha, now a middle-aged alcoholic, and her daughter, Anne. Peter and Anne develop a romance, which Marsha disapproves of, suspecting Peter's motives and his eerie knowledge of her past. Marsha becomes increasingly unstable, haunted by the belief that Peter is the reincarnation of her deceased husband, Jeff. The climax occurs at the lake where Jeff was murdered, with Marsha confronting and ultimately killing Peter, convinced that he is Jeff returned to torment her. The Return This one's a psychological thriller starring Sarah Michelle Geller. Joanna Mills, a sales rep, starts having some seriously creepy visions, and is drawn back to her childhood at home in Texas. There, she's haunted by memories of a crime she never witnessed and a life that's not hers. The twist is that the crime is connected to her in ways she never imagined. The movie plays with themes of reincarnation and unresolved past drama, all wrapped in this really interesting, moody, atmospheric setting. Sublime. This one is about George Greaves, who undergoes a routine procedure at Mount Abaddon Hospital, but ends up in a nightmarish situation. He was mistakenly given the wrong surgery due to a mix-up in patient names, which leads to bizarre post-operative experiences. In reality, a complication during a colonoscopy caused brain damage, leaving him in a vegetative state for 10 months. Inside his own mind, George battles his own fears and decides to commit suicide in the hope that it'll end his torment. He jumps from a 7th floor window in his dreamlike state and his real body flatlines in the hospital room, leading to his real physical death. The story explores the contrast between his inner world and the grim reality of his condition. Wendigo This one revolves around George, a high-strung photographer in his family, wife Kim, and son Miles, as they embark on a trip to upstate New York to escape the stress of city life. Their journey takes an unsettling turn when George accidentally hits a deer, leading to a heated encounter with a local named Otis. Upon arriving at their cabin, the atmosphere becomes increasingly foreboding. The next day, a shopkeeper shares with Miles the legend of the Wendigo, a supernatural creature from Native American folklore that's known for its shape-shifting abilities. As the family spends time in the woods, George suddenly collapses, leaving Miles alone and frightened. Miles encounters the Wendigo and passes out. Kim, searching for her family, eventually finds a bloodied George and they rush him to the hospital. Tragically, George doesn't survive his gunshot wound infected by Otis. Otis goes on to kill a sheriff and is pursued by the Wendigo. The Passion of Darkly Noon The film Darkly Noon follows the life of Darkly Noon, a young man raised in a strict Christian cult. After the cult's dissolution and the death of his parents, Darkly finds himself lost in the Appalachian forest. He's rescued by Jude, a coffin transporter, and Callie. Darkly grapples with his religious upbringing and growing attraction to Callie, who is in a relationship with a dude named Clay. As Darkly's inner turmoil intensifies, he encounters Clay's disapproving mother, Roxy, who believes that Callie is a witch trying to harm her family. Darkly befriends Jude, and together they discover a giant shoe in the river, which they use for a dog's funeral pyre after Roxy's dog dies. Jude proposes that he and Darkly leave together, but Roxy's suicide and hallucinations of his dead parents drive Darkly to madness. He attacks Callie and Clay, leading to a deadly fire. Jude arrives just in time to save them, but Darkly dies in Callie's arms. The next morning, a circus family arrives, looking for their lost giant shoe, and the group decides to seek help together. One of the children gives Callie a shoe resembling the lost one, bringing a somewhat surreal conclusion to the story. Deleter This film follows Lyra, who works shifts at a shadowy online content moderation office where employees, known as deleters, are tasked with the process of filtering graphic uploads from reaching social media platforms. The responsibility of censorship proves bearable for Lyra, whom her co-workers, as well as her boss Simon, observe as a cold person unfazed by the disturbing imagery that she sees on a daily basis. But what they don't know is that Lyra hides a deep trauma. Lyra's attempt to erase and forget her past has forced her to maintain an apathetic face to the horrors of the world. The Corruption of Chris Miller This one centers around Chris Miller, a teenage girl recovering from a traumatic R-word incident. She's recently moved in with her 
American stepmother Ruth at their countryside home in Spain. The arrival of a charismatic drifter named Barney Webster adds tension to their lives. Barney charms Ruth and she allows him to stay and work as a handyman. As the film progresses, Barney seduces both Chris and Ruth, creating a complex and twisted dynamic between the three. Chris is haunted by traumatic flashbacks related to her R word, triggered by storms and running water. This psychological trauma plays a significant role in the unfolding events. The narrative takes a dark turn when a mysterious man in a black rain shawl commits a brutal murder at a nearby family's farm, and Ruth and Chris suspect Barney's involvement. They believe that Barney might be the murderer. However, in a climactic sequence, Barney breaks into their home, and a series of events lead to his death at the hands of Chris and Ruth. They mistakenly believe that they have killed the murderer. The film's conclusion reveals the truth about Barney's intentions and connections to Chris's family, as well as the actual identity of the actual murderer. It also like delves into themes of manipulation and paranoia and the consequences of one's actions. Dream No Evil Dream No Evil is a psychological horror film released in 1970. It tells the story of a woman named Grace who grows up in an orphanage and later becomes a nun. However, after the death of her guardian, she decides to leave the convent and look for her father, who she believes is still alive. Grace is a troubled woman, and as she searches for her father, she becomes increasingly unstable. She starts to have disturbing dreams and visions that blur the lines between reality and some kind of fantasy. These dreams often involve her deceased father and a mysterious figure. The movie explores themes of religion and mental instability and the fine line between dreams and reality. The Forgotten The Forgotten is a science fiction thriller movie released in 2004. The film revolves around a grieving mother named Telly Pareto who believes that her young son Sam died in a plane crash. However, she soon discovers that nobody else remembers her son's even existence. Not even her husband or the authorities. Telly becomes convinced that there is like a sinister conspiracy to erase her son from everyone's memory. She meets another man, Ash, who has had a similar experience with his daughter's disappearance. Together they embark on a journey to discover the truth behind these mysterious events. Killer Nun This one revolves around Sister Gertrude, a nun working in a Catholic hospital for the elderly, who returns to work after having surgery to remove a brain tumor. Gertrude is plagued by anxiety and fears that her cancer has returned, even though her doctor and the mother superior dismiss her concerns. Unbeknownst to the convent, Gertrude leads a double life. She ventures into the city for sexual encounters with strangers, and abuses drugs obtained by Sister Mathieu, obtained by a fellow sister who has an unspoken attraction to Gertrude. Gertrude's behavior becomes increasingly erratic, and she begins mistreating patients. Yet, when Dr. Poi Rhett is fired from the hospital, Gertrude experiences a change in her personality. She enters a drug-induced state, and the sister who like, got her drugs, his grandfather, is bludgeoned to death. And then she covers up the crime to protect Gertrude. Dr. Patrick Rowland replaces Dr. Poi Rhett, and strange events continue to occur. Gertrude witnesses a sexual encounter between a patient and an orderly and she experiences disturbing nightmares. More murders take place, including one in which a patient is stabbed with needles and slashed. Gertrude confronts Peter, another patient who claims to know about the murders but refuses to reveal details. Peter is later found dead and Gertrude is escorted out of the hospital. The other sister confesses her drug theft to Dr. Roland and seduces him. Meanwhile, Gertrude is isolated in a cell, detoxing from drugs. She gradually realizes that she had been mistakenly assuming responsibility for the murders when it was the sister who committed them. The whole time. Cries in the night. So Heather arrives in a small town to stay with her eccentric and religious grandmother, Maud. Maud's house, once a funeral home, is now an inn. Heather's grandfather, James, an undertaker, has been missing for years. Guests Harry and Flory check in, but Maud becomes upset because they're unmarried. That night, their car is pushed into a quarry and they drown. Heather goes on a date with Rick and hears Maud talking to someone in the basement. Rick tells Heather about her grandfather's disturbing past. They explore the property and find James's hearse with a necklace bearing the initials HD. Heather hears Maud arguing with an unseen man about Helena Davis, who is missing and rumored to have eloped with James. Helena's husband confronts Maud and is later murdered. Oh, by the way, the whole time this is going on, there's a guy named Billy who's a handyman living with Maud. So then later, Heather and Rick find Billy's corpse in the basement. Maud attacks them 
revealing her dissociative identity. The police arrive and it's revealed that Maud murdered James and Helena, preserved James's corpse, and buried the others in the local graveyard. Schizoid. This one revolves around Julie Caffred, a recently divorced advice columnist in Los Angeles who joins a group therapy session led by Dr. Pieter Fales, a German psychologist. The therapy group meets in Pieter's house, which he shares with his daughter, Allison. As the therapy sessions progress, mysterious and brutal murders occur in the town. Julie starts receiving anonymous threatening notes. Pat, one of the therapy group members, is stalked and killed. Julie becomes close to Pieter, which angers her ex-boyfriend, Doug. More murders take place, including that of Rosemary, another group member. Suspicion falls on various characters, including Pieter's daughter, Allison. Julie decides to publish her phone number in the advice columnist to lure the killer into calling and being traced. Allison arrives at Julie's office with a gun, and a tense situation unfolds. However, it's revealed that Doug, Julie's ex-boyfriend, is the true killer. He had been motivated by Julie's disclosures about their marriage and perceived slights against him. A confrontation ensues, and Allison ultimately saves her father, Pieter, by killing Doug with a pair of scissors. The Amityville Curse The Amityville Curse is a horror film released in 1990. The story revolves around a group of friends who decide to rent a large old house in Amityville, New York. As they move into the house, they begin to experience a series of strange and terrifying events. It becomes evident that the house is plagued by some kind of a malevolent presence, and the group find themselves in a fight for their lives as they confront the horrors in the house. This movie is a part of the Amityville Horror franchise, which we will be talking about more of here. Which is a real place, by the way. Amityville is About Time. Amityville is About Time is another installment in the Amityville Horror series, released in 1992. The film centers on a family that acquires an antique clock from a yard sale and brings it into their home. However, they soon discover that the clock is not an ordinary timepiece, it possesses a supernatural and malevolent influence. As the clock's powers take hold, the family members are subjected to terrifying and disturbing experiences. They must unravel the mystery behind the clock lock and its connection to the Amityville house before it's too late. Amityville A New Generation Amityville A New Generation is a horror film released in 1993. The story follows Keith Terry, an artist who discovers a haunted mirror in an abandoned building. After taking the mirror home, strange and supernatural events begin to occur in his life. Keith soon realizes that the mirror has a dark, like, power that influences those around it. As he investigates the mirror's origins, he uncovers a connection to the infamous Amityville house and its history of evil. Hey. <coughs> Vuhlaya. This one is an Indian psychological horror film released in 2007. The story revolves around a newlywed couple, Siddharth and Avni, who return to their ancestral home in a remote village. The house is believed to be haunted by the spirit of a dancer named Manjulika. As strange and eerie events begin to occur in the house, Siddharth's friend, Dr. Aditya, a psychiatrist, is called to investigate. He discovers that Avni may be showing signs of a psychological disorder and begins to dig deeper into the mystery. Sorry, this one's kind of hard to research. Donkey Punch. Okay, I'm not gonna explain this one for uh, family-friendly reasons. Just uh, don't Google what Donkey Punch means. Ed Gein, The Butcher of Plainfield, is a biographical horror film that delves into the life and crimes of Ed Gein, a real-life serial killer and grave robber from Plainfield, Wisconsin. Ed Gein is infamous for his gruesome acts, which included not only murdering people, but exhuming corpses from graves and using human body parts to create macabre trophies and household items. The movie provides a fictionalized and dramatized portrayal of Ed Gein's life, showcasing his troubled upbringing, his obsession with his domineering mother, and the descent into madness that led him to commit horrific acts. It explores his desire to become closer to his deceased mother by fashioning a, quote, woman suit made from human skin and his collection of human remains. The Haunting of Molly Hartley. This one starts with Molly Hartley, a high school student who's trying to lead a normal life after a traumatic incident involving her mother. She's moved to a new house and school to start fresh. However, as her 18th birthday approaches, strange and unsettling events start to occur around her. Molly begins to experience hallucinations and nightmares, and she becomes increasingly paranoid. As Molly delves deeper into her family's history, she discovers that her parents made a dark pact with the devil to save her life when she's a child. That's kind of weird. Now, as her 18th birthday approaches, the devil is coming to collect what was promised. Molly 
must confront her sinister heritage and deal with the demonic forces that are closing in on her. This one's scary, dude. Yuvaram Nalum. Yuvaram Nalum, also known as 13B, Fear Has a New Address, is an Indian horror thriller released in 2009. The film was directed by Vikram K. Kumar and is known for its unique blend of horror and social commentary. The story revolves around a family that moves into a new apartment, number 13B. The head of the family, Manahar, discovers that a TV serial called Yuvaram Nalum, which means in English everyone is fine, airs at the same time every day on channel 13. As he and his family become engrossed in the show, they start to notice eerie parallels between the events in the serial and their own lives. Manahar starts to suspect that the TV serial is somehow controlling their lives and is responsible for a series of deaths in their apartment complex. He embarks on a quest to uncover the truth behind the haunting serial and its connection to his family's fate. The film delves into themes of superstition and paranoia and the impact of television on society. Dark Nature Dark Nature is a British horror film released in 2009, directed by Mark Delaney. The story is set in the remote Scottish highlands and follows a family's vacation gone awry. The film begins with a family traveling to a secluded cottage in the countryside, hoping for a peaceful getaway. However, their idyllic vacation takes a sinister turn when they encounter strange occurrences and unsettling events. As the family delves deeper into the mystery, they discover that the local wildlife is behaving unusually and aggressively. The film combines elements of ecological horror and psychological tension as it explores the relationship between humans and nature. False Positive False Positive is a psychological horror film released in 2021, directed by John Lee. The film is about Lucy, who, along with her husband Adrian, is trying to conceive a child. They seek the help of a renowned fertility specialist, Dr. John Hindle. Lucy becomes pregnant and, with his help, the couple is overjoyed. However, as Lucy's pregnancy progresses, she begins to suspect that something is terribly wrong. The film takes a dark turn as Lucy becomes increasingly paranoid about the intentions of Dr. Hindle and the medical procedures that she undergoes. She starts to believe that there is a sinister conspiracy behind her pregnancy, leading her down a path of disturbing discoveries and psychological horror. Yeah, that's why it's called False Positive, because it's a false positive. She Will She Will is a 2021 British horror film. The story revolves around Veronica, an older woman who lives alone in a mansion filled with strange artifacts and taxidermy. Her life takes a bizarre turn when she discovers a mysterious young woman named She washed ashore near her home. Veronica takes She in and their lives become increasingly entangled. As the film unfolds, it becomes apparent that Veronica's motivations are not entirely benevolent, and she may not be as innocent as she appears. A classic story of witches and uh, people named She. Atma. Atma is an Indian psychological horror film directed by Suparn Verma. The movie revolves around the character Maya, a young woman who is trying to protect her daughter, Nia, from her abusive and deceased husband's evil spirit. After her husband's death, Maya is determined to start a new life with her daughter, but her husband's vengeful spirit comes back to haunt them. The film explores themes of motherly love, supernatural elements, and psychological horror as Maya battles the malevolent spirit to ensure her daughter's safety. The Afflicted The Afflicted is a psychological thriller and horror film directed by Derek Lee Nixon. The story follows the Randall family, which includes Leslie, her two daughters, and her son. The family take in a woman named Maggie as a live-in nurse to care for Leslie, who is suffering from a debilitating illness. However, Maggie's true intentions become increasingly sinister as she subjects the family to emotional and physical abuse. By Now, Die Later By Now, Die Later is a Filipino horror anthology film that weaves together multiple stories through a common thread, an antique shop. This mysterious shop sells peculiar items that promise to fulfill people's desires. However, these deals often come with a sinister twist and supernatural consequences. Each segment of the film introduces us to different characters who seek to change their lives through these deals, only to find themselves trapped in horrifying predicaments. Like for example, one story focuses on a fading actress who purchases a rejuvenating cream from the clinic, leading to unintended and gruesome consequences. Another tale follows of a photographer who acquires a magical camera that captures people's last moments before they die. Demon Demon is a Polish supernatural horror film. The story centers on Fyodor, a man who travels to Poland to marry his fiancée Zanita and live in their family's rural estate. The wedding celebration should be a joyous occasion, but it takes a dark turn when Fyodor inexplicably becomes possessed by an evil spirit. The possession gradually reveals unsettling family secrets and exposes historical trauma connected to the estate. 
The film's eerie atmosphere and supernatural elements create a sense of unease and dread. Emily. Emily is a psychological thriller directed by Michael Thielen that explores themes of trust and paranoia and the vulnerability of like children. The story revolves around a seemingly ordinary babysitter named Anna who is hired to look after the Thompson family's three children while their parents go out for their anniversary. However, as the night progresses, it becomes evident that Anna is not who she claims to be. What makes Emily particularly unsettling is how it preys and the fears and anxieties parents have about leaving their children in the care of someone else. As Anna's true intentions are gradually revealed, the film takes a dark and disturbing turn. It raises questions about the people we trust with our loved ones and the potential dangers that can lurk behind seemingly normal facades. The film is a chilling exploration of the lengths one person can go to when driven by their obsessions and traumas. Excision Excision is a provocative and disturbing horror film. The story follows Pauline, a high school student with a morbid fascination with surgery and a desire to become a surgeon. However, Pauline's aspirations are at odds with her dysfunctional family life, where she faces constant criticism from her mother, who expects her to conform to societal norms. The film delves into Pauline's psyche, portraying her as this complex character who struggles with alienation and a yearning for acceptance. Her disturbing and vivid fantasies involving surgery are juxtaposed with her real-life experiences, including her strained relationship with her family and her attempts to fit in at school. Friend Request Friend Request is a horror thriller film film that explores the dark side of social media and the consequences of online interactions. The story follows Laura, a popular college student who accepts a friend request from Marina, a, local, a lonely classmate with no friends. After Laura unfriends Marina due to her erratic behavior, Marina takes her own life and curses Laura's social media page. What follows is a terrifying descent into the supernatural as Laura's friends die in gruesome ways. Also, before I keep going, like, I just want to say how that is like an actual fear. You know, I feel like, like I've gone through that, you know, where it's like, you're talking to like someone who doesn't have any friends and you feel like if you just like quit talking they're gonna kill themselves and i guess a lot of people know that because a lot of people use that like to get what they want from people like oh my god don't leave or i'll kill myself that's the worst bro i've had a girl say that to me i've had a few girls say that to me that is the absolute worst because you don't know what to do like you're just like sitting there and you're like what do i what do i say i don't want to be rude but i don't want to like fall into her trap either you know anyways this film taps into contemporary fears about the internet. As Laura tries to unravel the mystery behind Marina's curse, viewers are taken on a journey filled with suspense and jump scares and psychological horror. Geki Joben Zero Geki Joben Zero is a psychological horror film that serves as the final chapter in the Persona 3 The Movie series, based on the acclaimed video game Shin Megami Tensei Persona 3. While the series blends elements of supernatural and fantasy, Winter of Rebirth, which is the other name for the movie, specifically delves into the psychological aspects of his characters and the existential dread that haunts them. The story revolves around a group of high school students who possess the unique ability to summon personas, manifestations of their inner selves, to confront otherworldly threats known as shadows. As they face, quote, the fall, an enigmatic event that could bring about the end of the world, the film delves into the psychological turmoil of the characters. One of the central psychological themes explored in the film is the fear of death and the acceptance of mortality. The characters are confronted with the inevitability of their own demise as they battle powerful supernatural forces. Kokodi Kokoda Kokodi Kokoda is a psychological horror film from Sweden. The film weaves a deeply unsettling narrative that blurs the line between reality and nightmare. The story follows a grieving couple, Tobias and Ellen, who embark on a camping trip in the woods to heal their fractured relationship after a tragic loss. However, their peaceful getaway turns into a nightmarish loop of terror when they encounter a group of eerie, menacing figures during the night. These figures, including a man with a girl grotesque mask and a girl with a pet monkey, subject Tobias and Ellen to a never-ending cycle of torment and death. Each day they wake up to relive the exact same events trapped in this like nightmarish time loop. The Nightmare The Nightmare is a documentary-style horror film. Unlike traditional horror films, The Nightmare blurs the line between documentary and horror by exploring the phenomenon of sleep paralysis, a terrifying condition where individuals wake up unable to move, often experiencing vivid and terrifying hallucinations. The film features interviews with individuals who have actually experienced sleep paralysis, recounting their personal accounts of the phenomenon. These stories are accompanied by eerie reenactments that bring the hallucinations to life. Viewers are immersed in the harrowing experiences of those who suffer from sleep 
paralysis, which often involve encounters with shadowy figures, evil entities, and otherworldly horrors. The nightmare delves deep into the psychological horror of sleep paralysis, exploring the fear, helplessness, and uncertainty that plague its victims. It examines the impact of these recurring nightmares and the mental well-being of those who experience them, highlighting the lasting psychological trauma that they inflict. Tank 432 Tank 432, also known as Belly of the Bulldog, is a British horror thriller directed by Nick Gillipsy. The film combines elements of psychological horror and claustrophobia with a military setting. The story follows a group of British soldiers who, during a mission in an unspecified war zone, take refuge inside an abandoned armored personnel carrier known as Tank 432. However, their sanctuary quickly becomes a nightmarish prison when they discover that something sinister lurks both outside and inside the tank. As paranoia and fear mount, the soldiers must confront their own demons while trying to survive the mysterious and deadly threat. Wolves at the Door Wolves at the Door is an American horror film directed by John R. Leonetti. The film is loosely based on the real-life Manson family murders, a notorious and gruesome event in American history. Set in 1969, the story revolves around a group of friends who gather at a Los Angeles home for a peaceful evening. However, it takes a horrifying turn when they find themselves under siege by a group of intruders led by a charismatic and psychotic cult leader, clearly inspired by Charles Manson. And that's pretty much it. So, uh, thanks for watching the video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. You guys seem to enjoy the first psychological horror films, so I hope you guys like this one too. Thank you for watching, and have a great night. Sweet dreams.